Hey students, happy Sunday. Um, this is super fun. I'm hanging out with you guys. This is my home office. Sailor's head is right there. Say hi to Sailor. Hi. She wants to go on a WALK right now, and I told her, you gotta wait, girl. I got stuff to do. Um, so yeah, you're hanging out with me in my home office. It's super boring right now. I haven't really decided what to do with this room yet, so the walls are still just like super boring and blank, but I got this cool bookshelf, so you know, welcome, welcome, make yourselves at home. Um, how are you? Are you having a good evening so far? I hope you're having a good day. I hope that youth group has been fun so far. I hope you're having a good time checking in with your small group and your friends and all of the things. I'm so happy that Megan asked me if I would share the message tonight. This is fun. I've missed you guys and I hope you've had a super fun month getting um, in your new rhythm over there at youth group. I sure miss you guys, but I know that you're having a whole bunch of fun. Um, but I'm happy because I get to kind of wrap up the sermon series with us. So super cool. If I were there in person, I'd be like, guys, tell me all about what you've learned so far and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, just like, I don't know, text me or like go on Instagram or something and tell me everything you've learned because this was probably a really fun sermon series. Um, so, okay, let's get right into it, shall we? Okay, question, and I'm not going to pause um, for you to answer and you're going to see why in a second. Also, you guys, you have to actually answer the questions when I pause the video, when I tell you to pause the video. I know that it can be awkward to be the one that goes first. I know that, you know, you're six feet apart and you're wearing a mask, but it's going to be more fun if you actually answer the questions when I ask them in the video. Okay. Capiche? Capiche. Okay, cool. So you're going to actually answer the questions tonight. Awesome. Okay. Anyway, what would you do? If you could do anything you wanted and get away with it, anything in the whole world, would you rob a bank? Would you go to McDonald's and eat all the ice cream? Would you like break into your favorite skate park in the middle of the night and own the place to yourself? What would you do if you could do anything in the whole world and get away with it? I'm not pausing to tell you to answer that because I know some of y'all would have some illegal answers and I do not want to have to testify against you in court one day. So you just keep those little thoughts to yourself, but it's kind of interesting, right? Like, why don't we just go around doing whatever we want all the time? Like, if we, if our dream come true was to break into our favorite skate park in the middle of the night, why don't we do that, right? Why don't we go, um, like, sneak onto, I don't know, I'm making this up as I go, sneak onto a train and, like, go on a train ride across the country because that sounds super fun? Why don't we do anything that we want all the time? There's a few different reasons, of course. Number one, I think most of us were raised like to know right from wrong, right? Most of us know like you shouldn't do certain things. There are rules, there are consequences. There's a social order of things. Sailors saying hello. Um, so we just kind of know. Um, I think a lot of us have a basic understanding of right and wrong. I think most of us also know that, um, you know, if we run around doing whatever we want, someone could end up getting hurt. So if we, you know, stole a seat on the train, then the train's economy system would get damaged. I don't, I haven't thought the train thing through, but you're, you're tracking with me, right? You see, ha <laughs> ha, track, train track. Uh, you guys see what I mean? So I think most of us just know there's a right and a wrong to certain things. You don't know right and wrong. You're a naughty dog. Uh, most of us just know right and wrong to certain things, but I think there's this other reason. And it's the topic of our conversation tonight as we get into the final installment of your Vibes series that I know you guys have been on. Megan and Bailey have been doing so good leading you guys through that. And I'm sure that your small group leaders have helped you have just incredible conversations. Um, the last reason is guilt, right? Guilt is this thing that will happen if we do something wrong, right? And so we don't do things that we know are wrong because we don't want to feel guilty Feeling guilty is not a fun emotion. And so I think that in addition, of course, to not wanting to hurt anybody and knowing right from wrong, we don't um, do bad things because we don't want to feel guilty. But like it or not, we all mess up sometimes, right? Raise your hand if you've never messed up a day in your life. Bam! I know there was like two of you that raise your hands because you're silly. Um, we all mess up right? Like if your strategy for not ever wanting to feel guilty is to just never do anything wrong or never make a mistake or never mess up, it's never going to last, right? No matter how hard we try, no matter how well-intentioned we are, 
we all make mistakes, guys, right? We all do things wrong sometimes, even when we don't mean it, right? We all, every now and then, make decisions that might hurt somebody or might go against the rules. And so when that happens, oftentimes we feel guilty. And the thing is, I don't think we're always good at dealing with that. I think there's often two different camps of ways that we can deal with guilt, right? This is just from my perspective, take it or leave it. I think that a lot of people either ignore guilt, so they stuff it down, stuff, 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 they don't wanna deal with it, so they stuff it down, or they obsess over guilt and they stay stuck in it. So either stuff it or you stay stuck in it, right? Um, I think for some of us, we just ignore it. Like I said, you're kind of in the, maybe you in the circle of your small group tonight, you're in the kind of ignore it, stuff it down camp. And so if guilt comes up in you, you just pretend like it's not even there. You just ignore it. Um, no, no, no. I'm just going to keep moving. I didn't do anything wrong. That was all them. Um, we get defensive. We get argumentative. We don't own up when we do things. Um, and that's, that's going to end up hurting us in the end. Right. Um, Second thing is we could stay stuck in our guilt, obsess over it. And so those are the kind of people in your circle right now that maybe when you make a mistake and you do something wrong, you just go around and around and around. Keep thinking about it, keep thinking about it, keep thinking about it. Say you're sorry 500 times. Like you just keep apologizing. You can't let it go. Even after somebody has said they forgive you, you can't sleep at night because you're still thinking about that one bad thing you did when you were like seven, right? We can either stay stuck in it or stuff it. And that's the hard thing, right? So let's talk about guilt. Because if neither of those things, neither of those um, ways of coping are healthy, then what is a good way? Well, let's talk about what guilt is. Um, if you were at Winter Retreat um, last year, so Winter Retreat of 2020, thank God we got to do that, right? That was like the last hoorah, wasn't it? No, confirmation was the last hoorah. But Winter Retreat was good. Remember, if you were there, um, her name was Amy, and she was that woman that was leading worship with Michael, and she came up and did the panel with me and Bailey, and we were talking about guilt and shame. Remember that? She had a really good definition of guilt that I've always liked. She says that guilt happens when our actions go against our values. Our actions go against our values. And that makes a lot of sense to me. So for example, if we value honesty, if we value being truthful and we say something that's not truthful, we are probably going to feel guilty about that, right? We're going to feel that twinge of guilt rise up in us because our actions went against our values. If we value kindness and then we are mean to somebody, we're probably going to feel guilty because our action being mean went against our value of being kind, right? So with that definition of guilt in mind, pause the video, and around your small group, remember, um, we're all going to go, okay? Everybody's going to talk. List one or two things that you value, and then I want you to list actions that would go along with those values or go against those values. Pause the video and do that with each other. Wonderful. Now I want you to ask each other, which camp do you usually find yourself in when it comes to guilt? So do you usually ignore it? Are you in the stuff it camp? Do you usually ignore your guilt? Or do you stay stuck in it and obsess over it? How do you usually respond to guilt? And then follow-up question to that is how does your response end up hurting you in the end? Pause the video and have that conversation. Amazing. I hope you guys had good, good talks. Um, I know for me personally, I'm definitely in the stuck in it camp. Like I, ever since I was young, if I ever make a mistake, if I ever do something wrong or hurt somebody's feelings, I can just obsess over it for days. And I know that the thing that really changed things for me was honestly my relationship with Jesus. And now I know, listen, we're in a church. This is youth group. That's like the cheesy blanket answer sometimes. And it can kind of feel like an eye roll, like, of course, Jesus was the thing that's like made a difference in your life. But you guys, it's actually true. I wouldn't be telling you this if it wasn't true. Um, I wouldn't have my job if it wasn't true. So really, when I started getting to know Jesus, because for you guys who don't know, I didn't grow up in youth group like you guys did. So I, um, I heard bits and pieces at my school. And grant, I grew up, you know, I was your age quite a few years ago. And so times were different back then. I lived in a different state than we do now. The culture was different. 
um, the way people thought of God was really different. And so I would just hear bits and pieces from my friends about God, right? And that's how I kind of formulated what I thought he was like. And basically what it all added up to for me was um, God was really mad at me all the time. And he wanted me to feel guilty about stuff so that I would try really hard by myself to be better. That's what I had learned um, through my little schoolyard Sunday school, you could say. So when things really, so that really contributed to me feeling guilty my whole life and not really being able to come up out from under feeling guilty if I did something wrong. And then when I really got to know Jesus, when I was a little bit older in life, when I started having my own personal relationship with Jesus, I started getting to know who he really was. And I started reading the Bible and I started noticing how Jesus talked to people in scripture. I started talking to our pastors at Anona and really getting to know Jesus more and more for who he really was. And I started to learn that Jesus wasn't at all in the business of wanting me to feel guilty, quite the opposite. Jesus wanted to free me from my guilt. Jesus forgives me for my sins. When I mess up, Jesus is who I get to run to so that I can receive forgiveness and guidance and comfort for what to do and how to handle guilt in a better and a healthier way. So that's a way that I want to talk to you guys about tonight. Um, all centered around this idea of Jesus helping us handle our guilt a little bit better. So first thing, is it really starts with knowing students who you are and how much you're loved. So like I said, when I learned that Jesus loved me, when I learned that I was, when that Jesus would look at me and call me friend, call me child, call me lovable, call me worthy, um, call me forgiven, that gave me a sense of security in who I was and in how Jesus loved me so that when I did make mistakes, I didn't, I no longer struggled with thinking that, oh, that means I'm a terrible person and God can never love me, right? Jesus showed me that I am lovable no matter what I do because he loves me. And that's the same truth for every single person in the room today, every single person around the world today, right? So we get to walk in that kind of grace and identity with Jesus that he, he sees us differently than we see ourselves, right? So that's when things really started to change for me. You guys, I learned that Jesus was the one who wanted to take away my guilt, that Jesus was the one that I could run to um, when I had done something wrong, and that he would give me that grace, that forgiveness, um, and then help me move forward in, in a way that aligned with my values, right? If I had an action that went against my values, Jesus was that safe place where I could run to him, feel that comfort remember that I'm loved. Because I think for me, students, it came down to when I, especially when I was around your age, like middle and high school, I really struggled with guilt a lot. And I think I felt like if I did something wrong, if I made a mistake, that made me less lovable, right? If I didn't get all A's, which like, why would I even feel bad about that? Why would I even feel guilty about that? But some of you overachievers in the room, you'll get it. If I didn't get the grades that I wanted, if I, you know, made somebody mad at me, if I hurt somebody's feelings on accident, if I just made a mistake, if I did something wrong, it made me feel less lovable. And Jesus came into my life and showed me that that's not true, that he loves me no matter what I do. And so knowing that students, that is what gave me a foundation to be able to even handle guilt. Um, there's a verse that is in the Bible. My iPad's down here. That's why I'm looking up at it. Um, Romans 8, 1. And in that verse, Romans 8, chapter 1, or chapter 8, verse 1, Paul says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Condemnation is a word that kind of means like um, if you get sentenced to uh, a jail sentence or a prison sentence at a trial, right? To condemn you, to punish you, to sentence you. It's kind of like that. And so Paul's saying, hey, there's not that punishment. There's not that you are wrong and you are separated and you are bad and you are terrible. There's not that um, heavy weight anymore in Christ Jesus. Jesus offers forgiveness and he offers grace. And so because there's no condemnation, we can have confidence that we can go to God when we've made a mistake. We can be confident that we can go to God and say, hey, I need your forgiveness. I messed up. And he's not surprised, students. God is never surprised when we make a mistake. He's not going to be angry forever and make you feel bad for the rest of your life. He's going to offer you forgiveness because that's who he is. That's who we see him to be in Jesus. 
So we don't have to beat ourselves up. We don't have to stay stuck in our guilt. We don't have to think we're unlovable and make a mistake. When we feel that twinge of guilt, we can run straight to God, know that there's no condemnation, and be able to receive his forgiveness. Second thing about how to handle guilt in a more healthy way is that guilt can actually show us ways that we can live more according to what's right. Guilt can actually show us ways that we can live more according to what's right. We're going to get there in just a second, but first, that's a sneak peek. Before we jump into that second part, I want you guys to pause the video and ask each other. Uh, going back to talking about Jesus and what he can do for us, I want you guys to talk to each other and say, if you have heard about Jesus before, so some people, this is your first experience with church or youth group, totally fine. Um, but if you have heard, even if you've just been out and about and you've heard something about Jesus, um, has the things that you've heard made you feel more guilty or less guilty? If you've heard anything about Jesus before, has what you've heard made you feel more guilty or less guilty? Pause the video and ask each other that. Wonderful. Now I want you to ask each other, what are some things you've learned about Jesus that prove to you that he loves you and wants to take away your guilt? So kind of going, kind of ping-ponging the way that I did when I was younger, right? Um, if we know that Jesus wants to help us get free from our guilt, what are things that we can that we've learned about him that prove that? What are things that you've learned about Jesus that prove to you he loves you and wants to take away your guilt? Ask each other that. Great, and then last question for now, how can those things help you stop either beating yourself up so much or ignoring your guilt altogether? So of those good things, those things that are true about Jesus, about how much he loves you, how do those things help you depending on what camp you're in. Okay, fantastic. Now let's jump into the second part. Um, so like I said, the second thing is that guilt can show us ways that we can live more according to what's right. So go with me here, students. This is pretty cool. So there's this verse in 2 Corinthians 7.10. 2 Corinthians 7.10, and it says, Godly sorrow brings repentance. Okay? Godly sorrow brings repentance. So sorrow... You know what that means. Sorrow means you feel sad or you feel remorseful or you feel bad, kind of like guilt, right? Guilt in a godly way. So godly, inspired by God and the likeness of God, taking after God. Who? Who is God? God is love, point blank. Actual definition in the Bible. Godly guilt, guilt inspired by God's love, brings repentance. Repentance is a word that quite literally means to turn in a different way. So if you're about to walk off a cliff, uh, metaphorical repentance would say, Mirror, let's not do that, right? It's literally you're walking in a certain way and you turn and go a different way. So let's go back to one of our running examples here. Let's say there's we commit an action that goes against our value. We lie when we value truthfulness. So here we go. Now we have that twinge of guilt. So instead of, now you're at a fork in the road, students. Instead of saying, I'm either going to stay stuck in this forever or I'm going to ignore it, and pretend it's not there, godly sorrow brings repentance. So a godly response to guilt is going to say, hold on, I can actually use this to help me turn in a different way. If we are heading down a path through our actions of lying and not being truthful, right? Going on with our example here. Godly sorrow brings repentance. Godly guilt will help us turn back towards the truth. We get the opportunity, students, in that moment to say, oh, I just lied. Wait, that's not, that doesn't go along with my values. I want to be truthful. Truthfulness is important to me. And then, and then this is what you do, students. We get to pause. We get to pray and ask God to forgive us. Just confess. Ask God to forgive us. God, I just lied. I'm so sorry. Help me be truthful. Doesn't have to be crazy, doesn't have to be long. Doesn't have to be you getting on your hands and knees in the middle of your classroom, oh my God, I just lied. No, it can be in your heart, very simple. Just turn your heart to him, students. God, I just lied, I'm so sorry, help me be truthful. Ask God's forgiveness, trust that you've received it, right, he's a forgiving God, that's, that's what he loves to do. Second thing, after you ask God's forgiveness, ask forgiveness of whoever it is that might be hurt by your actions. If you lied to someone, Hey, I'm so sorry. That actually wasn't truthful. Let me make it right to you. I'm, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Right? Ask their forgiveness and then we make it right. 
That's the repentance piece. That's the turning. If guilt or if uh, lying is over here, repentance is me turning away from it and going into truthfulness. And that's exactly what you do when you apologize and try to make it right. It's actually not that complicated, students. It might be hard to do because it takes a lot of courage, but it's not complicated, right? It's just stopping, asking God's forgiveness, asking the forgiveness of whoever you hurt, and then turning, turning in the other way, turning towards the things that we value. Wow, this is, and then that's pretty freeing, right? Wow, this is awesome. I'm turning back in the way of truthfulness now. The key is, students, we don't beat ourselves up after. We don't stay stuck feeling that terrible feeling of going over and over in our minds of, oh my gosh, I'm so guilty, I'm so guilty. Students, we just turn the other way and then we keep moving forward on the path of the things we value, right? Godly sorrow brings repentance. We feel that twinge of guilt, ask God's forgiveness, ask forgiveness of others, repent, turn back towards the thing that is on our values, and then we forgive ourselves, students. We trust that if God's forgiven us, we can forgive ourselves too. So last little section of questions, pause the video now and ask each other this. On a scale of one to 10, how hard do you think it would be to actually handle guilt in that way in real life? To actually be able to stop and say, okay, I feel this, let me pray for forgiveness, let me go ask that person's forgiveness and let me repent and move on. How hard would it actually be to do that? Scale of one to 10, ready, go. All right, awesome. Now ask each other what aspects of this are easy and what aspects of it are hard. Of that little formula I just gave you, what parts of that are easy, what parts of it are hard, and why? And then last but not least, what do you think the benefits would be of handling guilt in this way instead of either ignoring it or staying stuck in it? How could this new way be better? Pause and talk to each other about that. Awesome. Students, I know that it's not always easy. Sometimes it's easier to ignore our guilt because then we don't have to be honest and say we messed up. We don't have to face the fact that we might've hurt somebody or that we were wrong. That's hard, students. I'm gonna be 30 in a couple months and it's hard for me to admit that I'm wrong. <laughs> I don't wanna be wrong. <laughs> Nobody wants to hurt somebody. Nobody wants to do anything wrong. It can be hard, students. Sometimes it can be easier, it feels like, you know, in the moment, to stay stuck in our guilt. Because if we beat ourselves up enough, then maybe nobody else will get the chance to, you know, whatever our thinking is on that. But the truth is, students, neither of those things are what God wants for you and me. God loves you so much. Jesus died for your freedom, freedom from guilt, freedom from beating yourself up, freedom from having to ignore the mistakes that we make. And we get this beautiful relationship with God. When Jesus died on the cross and rose again, he gave us the opportunity to have an uninhibited relationship with God. A God who loves us, a God who forgives us, a God who restores us, and a God who knows that we're going to mess up sometimes, you guys. It's okay. Whatever it is that we've done, whatever it is that we will do, trust that God's big enough to handle that. Students, you don't need to beat yourself up anymore. You don't need to ignore it anymore. Guilt does not get to be the boss of you anymore. God loves you. His grace is enough for you. And there's a better way to handle guilt. I love y'all. I miss y'all. Have a great rest of your small group. And I will see you soon.